Hey, so uh, in, in this uh, short lecture from chapter 11 in your textbook, we're going to be considering leadership. Uh, so when we talk about leadership, it's important to recognize that, that there is not a lot of agreement. There's not a lot of consensus regarding uh, what leadership is or what constitutes good leadership. So for the sake of, of having a foundation for, for our discussion and, and from that, this critical uh, communication perspective that, that we've been uh, using all semester, we're going to view leadership, uh, much like we do many other things, as, as uh, being socially constructed. So in other words, the notion of leadership is something that we've come up with together as, as a society. And so, specifically, your book says it's a discourse, right? It's a conversation. It's, it's, uh, it's a conversation that's created by researchers, uh, popular culture, because there's lots of representations of leaders in popular culture, excuse me, the media, and in industry itself, that works to frame the world in certain ways. And, and so, today, leadership has become a, a buzzword, particularly in business schools. And leadership is uh, something that, that we're focusing on quite a bit. Uh, I, I think perhaps to our, to our detriment. But in any event, if you, you just take a look on Amazon, you'll see that there are lots of best-selling books, and indeed there's a whole industry that's... Uh, arisen out of uh, people's interest in, in leadership and how to lead organizations uh, as well as their own lives more effectively. And so you see things like the works of uh, Jocko Willenick and Leif Babin, the two Navy SEALs uh, that have turned their examination of leadership into uh, a small cottage industry. Uh, there's, there's tons of, of these kinds of books, Five Levels for Leadership, uh, Leaders Eat Last. All these books purport to, to tell us what good leadership looks like. Uh, now, of course, not all the books agree uh, on what good leadership looks like, which gets back to the point that, you know, generally we don't agree on, on what makes for, for good leadership. So there have been various attempts to define leadership over time. And so Stodgill is an important definition. He defines leadership as the process of influencing the activities of an organized group in its efforts towards goal setting and achievement. Now, within this context, then, uh, there are three broad ways uh, of looking at this kind of leadership, the trade approach, style approach, and situational approach. And we'll talk about each of these uh, as we go through this short lecture. First, we'll talk about the trade approach. And, and the trade approach is, is what we might call a great man approach. Uh, this is the idea that uh, there, there are, famously, there's, there's a great man uh, theory of history. And, and this idea is that uh, history is shaped by the works of uh, individual men. Uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, uh, Thomas Edison, right? That, that there are single men who's, who are so influential that they change the very course of history. Now, over time, this great man narrative has, has lost steam. People, people aren't as interested in it as they used to be. Uh, but nevertheless, the trade approach uh, goes with this great man idea. And this is, this is a style of thinking about leadership that, that has largely fallen out of popularity. Uh, but a lot of early leadership research uh, was dominated by, by this approach and, and, and by efforts to establish the kinds of traits successful leaders uh, show. And the idea behind this is that the leader is born with these qualities. These, leadership isn't learned. You're born a leader, according to the trade approach. And, and so as a result, they, they focus on three characteristics. A leader's physical appearance, their abilities, and their personality. So Grint describes sort of the model, the archetypal, which, which means uh, sort of the model for the perfect leader in Western society, as tall, handsome, white, alpha male of privilege. Now, obviously, uh, this is a trait-centered approach because we're just looking at, at the physical appearance, uh, the physical characteristics that someone's born with, right? They, they hit the genetic lottery and, and they come up with, with all this. 
Uh, other traits include things like intelligence, uh, talkativeness, self-confidence, initiative, sociability, and so on. So uh, this, this kind of research that focused on, on the, these traits was popular up until the 1940s, but eventually people discovered that it just had too many problems. Uh, no one really agreed about the key traits that great leaders were supposed to share. Um, it, it tried to apply the same traits across all different types of organizations, and, and, and they didn't stop to recognize that the, the qualities a leader might need to have in a nonprofit might be different than those in a for-profit corporation, or the, the traits that a military leader has to have are, are different than one that, that some private citizen might have to have. Um, it also ignored the roles of followers, and this is an important point. Uh, and it's, it's so simple, but it was one that I really overlooked for, for a long time and never thought about until I started reading about leadership in graduate school. And that is that uh, in order to be a leader, you have to have followers. And if you don't, uh, you're a leader in name only. So, so the trade approach ignores the role of followers. And also, of course, it privileges genetics, the idea that great leaders are simply born rather than, than made. Now, we can look around the, the business world today and, and see many successful executives that, that uh, are, are certainly not tall, handsome, white, alpha males of, of privilege. Uh, is the Apple computer uh, led by Tim Cook is the, well, has been uh, periodically uh, over the past the, the, the most valuable company in the history of man, valued at over a trillion dollars, and, and he certainly uh, doesn't fit the mold of, of the uh, hyper-aggressive, uh, macho uh, CEO of privilege, right? He's, a, he's an openly gay, very soft-spoken man, right? And then when you look around at companies like Pepsi, Xerox, Google, we, we see leadership has been invested in people that don't match this trait model but indeed they are enormously successful at what they do. So the style approach superseded the trade approach. It, it, it becomes dominant uh, from, from the late 40s through the 60s. And the idea behind the style approach is that uh, leadership is about behaviors. It's about how people act. And, and so as a result, we start looking at behavior. What, how, how do great leaders act? And, and, and we shift from selecting leaders based on, on their traits to training people how to act like a leader uh, in, in different situations. Now, within this context of the style approach, there are three generally recognized styles that, that we discuss. The autocratic, the, the laissez-faire, and, and the democratic style. Now, the laissez-faire approach is what we call a hands-off approach. In French, laissez-faire literally means hands-off. And, and, you know, in studying these forms of leadership, they evaluated how efficient they were, how, how productive employees were when led in these ways. And what we found is that with the laissez-faire model, the hands-off model, uh, where a leader simply establishes some goals and then lets workers do what they want, generally it was uh, ineffective compared to the others. The second style that we talk about is the autocratic style. Now, autocratic is highly controlling. You might think of micromanaging, the boss who micromanages. And, and in these circumstances, in terms of its effectiveness, what we saw is that followers would focus when the leader was there, but slack off as soon as he or she left. Um, then finally, there's this democratic style, which promotes participation, whether or not the leader is present, uh, and, and generally found the most satisfying for everyone involved. Now, it's important to note that even though this sounds really good, that the autocratic style is the most effective in terms of productivity. <laughs> so, uh, you know, although we all want this to, to be the style that, that works best, we all uh, are likely fans of the democratic style in terms of its ideology, we, we know that this kind of highly controlling style is, is uh, oftentimes more effective in terms of production. So because of, of this tension, right, uh, researchers during this period of time from the 40s to the 60s wanted to look at, you know, what is the balance between satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and, and, and being productive? And, and they thought, well, you know, we, we need, to, need to think about, you know, what are, what are these styles? What makes people happy? What makes them productive? And they said, well, consideration 
makes people happy. This is when leaders show concern for their workers as people, and, and they respond to their needs. Now, in terms of being productive, initiating structure is really good. This is where the leader really focuses on the task, defines exactly what each person is supposed to do. So it is, to some degree, a kind of micromanagement. So consideration gives us the most satisfaction, the highest morale. Initiating gives us the highest productivity. So the, the theory is that a good leader does both of these. So, so it's all about combining consideration and, and, and um, initiating structure in order to achieve the, the, the optimal level of worker satisfaction and productivity. This graph represents it. I won't spend a lot of time going over it, but you're welcome to, to take a look and, and see uh, how, how concern for people uh, works uh, to, to make different kinds of management styles when uh, juxtaposed with concern for results. Now, there are, of course, uh, critiques of every kind of approach, and, and the style approach is no different. What people said about the, the style approach is that it, it ignores forms of leadership that occur on the non-managerial level. Specifically, we know that there are leaders within uh, communities of, of workers and laborers that aren't recognized formally as leaders. So the question becomes, what about them? They're leading even if they're not recognized as leaders by the organization. Then there's also a problem proving a causal or a cause and effect kind of connection between styles and performance. So although, generally speaking, we could say that the autocratic style is the most efficient, that's not always the case. So this makes establishing a clear causal connection, uh, instead of just a correlation, difficult. And then finally, it, it largely ignores situational factors. The idea that leadership is, is, different forms of leadership are required in different contexts, in different situations. So as a result, as, as kind of a response to this, we see the rise of the situational approach, which is still fairly popular today. And, and the situational approach, uh, if, if you ask someone who, who is an advocate of this approach, and you say, what makes a good leader, their answer is going to be, well, it depends. Right? It depends on, on contingency, on, on the situation, on, on the possible outcomes. And, and so Fiedler, for example, a researcher, said uh, effectiveness of an organization really depends on two different things, the personality of the leader and, and the extent to which the situation provides the leader with influence. So, uh, this is interesting, I think, the, this idea of, of the situation providing the leader with influence. And I like to think about it in terms of, a, of an airplane. So, if you're on the airplane and everything's going fine, and you're flying from Atlanta to New York, uh, then the leader of, of, of this operation is the pilot. However, if someone gets sick, eats, uh, eats bad fish, you know, on the, on the plane, and, and gets food poisoning and is gravely ill, the, the, the first thing that, that they ask is, is there a doctor on board? And if there is, then the doctor assumes leadership in that context, because the doctor has the influence, right? The situation has given rise to the doctor's leadership. And, and that's what the situational approach is all about. So according to this approach, uh, we measure leadership along two dimensions. We can look at leaders who are relationship-oriented or and task-oriented. So this is very similar to the breakdown that we saw uh, formerly in the, in the style approach. Now, with, with Fiedler's model, we further break things down, right, to measure the situation as well along three dimensions, right? So, so again, this is taking things one step further even than what we saw in, in the style approach. So here... Uh, we measure the situation again along three dimensions. So we look at uh, the degree to which the leader feels supported. This is known as leader-member relations. So, so, so does the leader feel like his followers are behind him? The structure of the task. How clear-cut is the task? How much ambiguity is there in the situation? And, and then uh, the, the position of power. Does the leader have the ability to, to give rewards? Does the leader have the ability to punish, etc.? So these provide us with, with measures for the situation, for looking at the situation and assessing it, and then, and then figuring out you know, what kind of leadership works best in, in this context. So the situational approach overall looks at leadership as a psychological process instead of a social one. Now, again, all of these approaches are critiqued. 
So this, it's the same with the situational approach. And, and people say, and this is very similar to the, to the criticisms uh, levied in some of the other ones, no attention is really given to informal leaders. And, and instead what we see is that we're really fitting situations to leaders rather than the other way around, and that oftentimes it results in inconsistent findings. All right, so that's it for this short lecture. Thanks for checking it out. Next time we'll talk about uh, the newest approaches to leadership.